baseball example, right? If someone played had a really high batting average the first half of the season, but over their career they hit only like uh, 275, then you'd expect their average for the whole season to move back down toward 275. Or if in basketball the team is off to a, a, a hot start in the first half, you'd expect them not necessarily to be worse in the second half, um, worse than their average, but you expect them to be closer to their average and the total score to be closer to their average, assuming that independent of the team they're playing. So, so, yeah. so in this example, the top student actually won, the top student are the average student. They just perform well in the first round. Right, right. So if you look at any set and you have some distribution, there's going to be, if it's, I guess if it's large enough, you're going to have some top students. Right? It's a random process and it has some variance to it. So some students are going to get lucky and get nine, to not, not, get 9 out of 10 of the first questions correct. But that doesn't mean that they're going to do better in the second half of the test. Right? So, okay. So, so this, is, this is the idea of regressing to the mean. Um, what does this have to do with, with uh, uh, what does it have to do with least squares? And what does this have to do with these regularization parameters? Okay, so, so what is this regularization terms doing? It's saying you want to minimize this, this expression here. And this says if, you're, if A here, this is a vector, so if the coefficients of A are large, so S is going to be a positive value. If the coefficients of A are large in either of these cases, then it's it's a, uh, um, then it's going to penalize that choice of A. Right? So what it's going to tend to do, the coefficients of A being large correspond with a, with a line that has a high slope. So the, the A that you find for the ridge regression or the lasso is probably going to have a smaller slope. Okay, and why would we want to do that for these squares? Why would we want the slope to be smaller? Well, we're, it, it makes sense when you think of the, so, so it, it's easier to think of if the, if the data is centered at the origin. So actually, let me draw the axes a, a little bit differently. Does that minimize y? So if I drew the axes here, right, then the red one goes through the through the centroid, and these points are centered around the zero, so they're the centroid of them is zero. Then, then the one that's been regularized is going to have a smaller slope. Okay, so what it's saying is that the mean y value is going to be zero right here. And I, and I want to guess that even though I've seen some data so far, it's going to tend to be closer to the mean if I see new data, right? So I have some data that I saw, and then I'm getting some new data, and I expect the new data to be closer to the mean than, than the data I saw, right? And so some students did, did well, some students did poorly, right? Now, it could be that some of the students are actually um, doing better on the test. They actually know more, more of this material. So I'm not going to guess exactly 75%. So I'm, I'm going to downweight them. I'm still saying this student who did well had certain characteristics and did well here. I'm going to expect that this student is still going to do better than the average student. But not as exactly as well as, their, as, as the data would predict You know, if I just took the least square solution. And we talked about this Gauss, um, we talked about this Gauss Markov theorem, and that said that if you assume that there was no bias in your solution, then the least squares was, was the best you could do. But this is allowing some bias in your solution, and then when you see new data, it will tend to, it, this will tend to, uh, um, to, this will tend to perform better. And really, your goal here is is to try and predict this this new data as you're adding, if you see a different point, 
you're really creating this function, so when you see a different point, you're predicting what the value is. Your goal is on the new data, not on your existing data. Because you already know the values of your, of your existing data. Okay, so this is my attempt to uh, attempt to explain why you want to do this regularization. Um, so, so we'll we'll talk more about cross validation on Wednesday, and and we'll we'll kind of uh, kind of walk through this from a slightly different perspective. Um, but so so hopefully I've at least kind of at the very least made you curious that. That you might want to try this, um, and, and that it, you might believe me that it might work better. I'll, I'll tell you that if you choose S correctly, then it, it, it actually probably should work better. And I'll next Wednesday I'll explain this in a little bit more uh, with a little bit more detail. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, so so that was one thing. That was why we use this regularization term. But why do we want to use this L1 norm instead of the L2 norm? Okay, so let's let's draw a picture here, and we drew some some similar pictures when we were talking about distances before. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to look at the L1 norm and the L2 norm of a vector A, right? So I can only draw. In here, here I can only draw in two dimensions, and I'll explain how this works in higher dimensions. But think of A as having two possible values. Uh, it's it's uh, as has two coefficients here described. And so we're going to draw a a um, we're going to draw a um, a ball. Um, let's start with the L two ball. Um, the, the the L two ball of A of radius t. Right? So, so this is going to be a distance t here. So you can think of this as being 1. So it is, so, so this point is minus t. This is t in, uh, in the y coordinate and the, or the x, x1 coordinate and x2 coordinate, you know, minus t right here. So this is the um, a2 equals t. And I can also draw the, the L1 ball, which is a lot easier to draw. Um, um, so this is the, the L1 ball of A, of radius t again. So, all right. So, so I am going to talk about the lasso. Um, actually, I use t here because there's an equivalent formulation of the lasso, where instead of solving for this with this parameter s, you can say I'm going to find a equals the r min a. This is the same base squares cost, and then I'm not going to have this um, this regularization term, but I'm going to have this hard constraint such that the um, such that the L1 norm of n is less than t. Okay, so instead of saying I want to minimize it with respect to this added on parameter with this, where you use this s here, I'm going to enforce that that this um, that this, uh, the L1 cost is less than t for a different parameter t. And I claim that these two formulations are equivalent for a proper choice of, of s and t. So in, in, in particular, for any choice of s, I will get the same solution if I choose my choice of t correctly. OK, is this, um, can you see why this is true? What's going to happen is that when I solve for this expression for a given choice of, of s, I can look at the, the L1 norm of, of A after I've solved it, right? 
I can look at this L1 norm A, and if that L1 norm is exactly T, then these are the same solutions. Because I can, I, um, whereas if I'm allowed to, in, if I'm allowed to decrease the, this, the, this L1 norm, um, then I'm going to still get the same solution. It's not going to help me. Um, whereas that as I, as I increase this value S, I need a larger value. Um, I, I'm going to, um, as I increase S, um, I'm going to have to enforce that the value A I'm going to get out is going to be smaller because I'm going to have to pay more for these coefficients. As S increases, I pay more for these coefficients. So, so that means I'll tend to get a smaller A. And every A I get out will have some least square solution. So if I find the least square solution up to some, some value T, then this is equivalent going to be the, this, uh, this solution that's been regularized by S. So it is, as you increase S, you decrease T. As you decrease T, you increase S. And you can go back and forth. And the same dual version holds for the, the, um, the rigid regression as well. Um, OK, so this view of having a fixed T is going to be very useful in this view here, right? So these are this is the space of all the coefficients A that I can I can use, which are within a ball, either an L1 ball in green or an L2 ball in blue. Okay? So now I'm going to draw in this space. This is going to be a star. This is going to be, let's say this was the least squares. Um, the least square solution. Okay, now, now, I, I, I want to try and draw what um, the values of um, I want to try and draw the values of of x and y here, but they don't live in this space. But because you can you can decompose least squares costs, you can think of them coming out of, out of the board here, and so you only care about this subspace. Um, but let's say this is the least square solution. And I want to get as close to this as possible, but I'm forced to stay inside of this ball. So what I can do is I can draw a, a ball around here. So this is the least squares ball. Right? This is my cost from some point I'm going to choose. So, so this is my solution for um, this is my solution for ridge regression. This can be this closest point on inside of this L2 ball with radius t to this least square solution. Okay. So so. Um, but if I, if I look at the closest point under the L1 ball, it's going to end up being down here. And it's going to be slightly different. So I'm going to get a slightly different solution here. And so this is the additional L2 cost I pay in addition. So I've got this L2 cost, which is as good as I can do. And I'm paying something a little bit extra because I've got this regularization. So, so this is the cost of the ridge regression, or the, the ridge regression solution, and this is the lasso um, of the lasso solution. Okay, so now something kind of funny has happened here. The lasso solution happened to be on the corner. It happened to be on the corner of this of this pointy L1 ball. This is very much not by accident. This is the whole point of using an L1 ball. This has these corners. And in high dimensions, I can't really draw it, but it looks even more spiky. These corners are really sticking out much further than this part here. Now, I, I, I made you do these, uh, this assignment earlier where you looked at the ratio of the volumes between the L1 ball and the L2 ball in, in a couple of different ways. And I, I guess some of you were a little confused while I was doing it then, but you saw that the L1 ball was much smaller in volume than the L2 ball. 
but it's still reaching these same points here at, at all of, along all the axes. So it's, that should help demonstrate to you that in high dimensions it's much, much pointier than the L2 ball. And so the closest point to the least square solution, which is going to be your lasso solution, is going to tend to be on these corners. Okay, so, so what's good about being on these corners? You know where the corners are. Okay, good. Um, you know where the corners are, but there are still a lot of corners. There are two to the, two to the D corners, I think, or some exponential on D. So you, you actually don't want to combinatorially search over them, um, although you could, um, but that's generally going to be too expensive. Um, this, this problem is still going to be, if you think of that, you could, you could do the L1 ball, which is something that, if you kind of do this, it, this kind of approaches, I mean, the, the L0 ball, it kind of approaches this. And then the solutions are always on the corners. Um, it's, it's actually going to, you can actually draw it, but if you think of this as the L1 half ball, it'll move in. Then you, then you need to combinatorially search the corners. The, L, the L1, there's actually going to be a convex, it's still convex, and so you can still, we'll be able to still solve the last one, and I'll, I'll sketch how to do that in a little bit. Um, so, so it's not going to help so much with, this, with finding, the, finding the solution, but the fact that the solution is on the corners is going to be important. So, if I look at the solution and I look at, so I have the x1 coordinate and the x2 coordinate. If I compare the solution for, um, let's call this r1, r2, for the ridge regression versus the solution um, for the lasso, L, L1 and L2. Um, if I look at these solutions, what's notable about the solution for lasso? particular, the x2 coordinate. It's going to be zero, right? And when you're on the corners, or you're maybe you're on one of these kind of pointy ridges, you may not hit a corner exactly, you're going to have a lot of these coefficients which are zero. Right, so this is really cool, right? It means that when you solve for this and, and your A has some really large number of coefficients, a lot of them you're saying, these coefficients are zero, I can completely ignore them. So the, the lasso is, is going to give you sparsity. Sparsity in your solution. Right? This is very important. It's, it shows you that when, whereas, whereas the L2, the ridge regression, this, R, this X2 coefficient is going to be pretty small, but you're still reporting it. Right? And even if it gets really, really small here, you're still going to report it. But you're better off kind of, uh, in some ways, just ignoring it. It's probably, if, you're, if your coefficient is much smaller than the other ones, then it's probably noise. Right? And, it's, and so you want to com completely ignore it. And the, and the L1, um, the L1 solution is going to force you to ignore these very small coefficients. So if you remember from, from the compressed sensing as well, we were trying to find a small number of values here, think of these as your coefficients in A, and leave the rest of them zero. So if, you're, if you use the lasso to solve this, then it's going to give you a small number of coefficients and leave the, and, and leave the rest zero, which is exactly what you want in a compressed sensor. So that's why the lasso is so powerful for doing this, this compressed sensor. If you notice here also, and I, I did this on purpose, um, you have fewer rows um, than you do uh, the than you do the columns. So this should be this is something you can't solve with these squares because it's going to have a null space of, of solutions. Um, it's going to have an infinite number of solutions. But if you enforce that the solution is sparse. Under certain conditions, which are fairly technical, um, I, I mentioned you can actually recover these, these sparse, uh, sparse values here. So, so this is kind of a really, really powerful technique that allows you to do this. And, and the, this, using this lasso by optimizing 
this essentially you optimize all these squares, but you add on this extra constraint. Um, either this regularization term or this hard constraint is, is, is going to give you a good solution for the compressed sensing problem. And also is going to give you a um, robust version of the linear regression where a lot of the coefficients are going to be zero, meaning the coefficients which don't really add very much, you just snap those all the way to zero. So that, that not only is in some ways more robust because you're not dealing with these noise, um, these noise coefficients, but it's also more efficient to deal with because you, you don't have to process them at all. You can, you can ignore all, the, all that data is what that's saying. Okay. Um, so, so, so have I maybe convinced you that the, the lasso version of this regularization is better than this ridge uh, regression if you're in high dimensions? Um, so, so hopefully I've at least convinced you that it's something you should, you should, you should consider trying if you have a chance to. Um, unfortunately, the ridge regression, while well, it had this nice way of solving for it, you just very easy to do in MATLAB, the lasso is not so easy. You can't just, uh, you can't just take a matrix inverse and, you know, and be done with it. Um, so we're going to have to, we're going to have to be a little bit smarter here. Okay, so the other good thing about this parameter t is that we can, we can, and one of the bad things was we had to figure out what was the right parameter. Um, but the good thing is we're going to have to we're going to have to think about what is the right parameter. So we're going to say if we started, let's see. So so t was equal to zero, right? If t is equal to zero, then it should be easy to solve, right? How do you solve this if t is equal to zero? So th this is the norm of a vector. It must be less than zero, but less than or equal to zero. So it has to be zero, right? So if t is equal to zero, this is very easy, right? So, so we know how to solve this. So we start start with t equal to zero, and the output is that a is a transpose. It is is going to be zero in all of the coordinates. Okay, so if t is equal to zero, this is going to be easy to solve. If that means this ball has is shrunk so that it only contains points inside zero, and you know we're going to have this huge loss here. We're, we're, this is not the right choice of t, right? But but it's easy to solve. So it's that's a starting point. Okay, so now let's say that t is going to be slightly larger than slightly larger than zero. Okay, so, so make t, t you know, just greater than zero. So something like this. So like um, 0.01 or? Um, yeah, so this, so, so well, we want, actually set some value, we'll do this in kind of a, we'll figure out some value in, in, a, in a little bit, but um, just think of it as slightly bigger than zero. What is a guess of what this solution is going to be? So this is a lot of regularization. The more regularization you do, the larger t is, the more sparsity you need. So you're going to have more sparsity. If, if t was infinity, Right, then the value is going to be the least square solution. That's another value that we have. The least square solution is going to have a dense. And as t goes to zero, it's going to have a be sparse. So now if you move t just above zero, how do you think the solution is going to look? So in this case, you're going to have these. Um, well, so there can be some weird cases, but it's in, in general, it's going to have one non-zero um, 
coefficients. So A is going to be all zeros except for one location. Okay, so, so and as you increase T, it's going to be non-zero at more and more, no, more and more locations. It's not going to continuously increase, it could decrease, but in generally it'll, it'll increase. Um, okay, so, so how do we, so if this is the case for just above zero, how do we figure out which coefficient is going to be the first one to turn non-zero? I, I happen to leave, although I did leave the orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm up on the board, I happen to leave these, these notes up here. So how did we do this here? How did we figure out which of the directions was the first one to move? You kind of pick the guess based on the gamma that you want to try to solve for, right? Yes. So so what we can do is we can we can look at this uh, this essentially look at this least square solution, or you could think of another solution lying out of this plane somehow, but. And you can look at the, the direction of each of these um, of each of these, these these axes, each of the coefficients, and you see which one is is getting me to the least square solution the fastest. Right. So, so you can say, um, let me write this up in notation. Um, so I'm going to say that J1 is going to be this is going to be the first coordinate that I make non-zero. It's going to be um, R max J of the dot product of XJ with uh, with dot. So I'm going to look at which of these coordinates. So that that means so. It's hard to draw a picture here, but the least square solution you can think of as being the best representation. All the coordinates are sitting kind of averaged out here. So I think of looking towards a least square solution, and which of these directions is the closest? It's moving the closest towards that. Yeah. This x1 direction is, as I move here, I get much closer to least square solution than if I do if I move along the x2 direction. And so. The one in this case is going to be the x1 direction instead of x2. That's the first one that's going to be non-zero. And in fact, even up to t out here, this is the only non-zero solution. As I moved, eventually, as I moved t out to somewhere like here, right, at this point, then this L2 ball is touching not on the corner. So there's some place in between where it uses both. But for the first few values of t, it's only this solution. So you find the direction which is maximizing this. Okay, so this is the same thing we started out with the orthogonal matching pursuit. And there, there still could be ties that you have if your data is small enough or if it's, if it's kind of these zero, one matrices. If your data is non, it's not a zero, one matrix, you're much less likely to have these ties and not to worry about it. But if you have multiple things that are tied, then what you do is you move along, you then you pick both of these coordinates and you and you and they both become your first non-zero coordinates at the same time. But in, in, in many cases you don't have to worry about that. If you're there's there's code out there that does this, but if you were to do code it up yourself, you'd have to worry about these these times. Um, okay, but in, in general, don't worry about times. So there's gonna be one maximum coordinate. Okay. So now that we have, we've, we've started with t, and it's slightly above 0. OK, so t is slightly above 0. And if we, we're going to keep increasing t, as we increase t, we have some budget for our coefficients of a. And we have more and more budget. And as long as this is the only coordinate, then what we can do is we can just as we can set the first the, the j1 coordinate to be equal to t, right? So as we increase t, we can maintain what is the best solution. 
right? So, so what we're going to do is let me try and sketch out this algorithm in a bit more detail. Um, so, aj equals zero and bj equals zero um, for all um, j in, in d. So, this is so these are going to be the coefficients of a, and these are going to be the slopes of of uh, essentially of the, these these coordinates that we have. Um, and so the the first thing we do is again we're going to set j1 equal to the r max of j of x j y and um, and at the same time we're going to set b j1 equals to one. So we're going to have to maintain a set of coefficients. And these are going to be normalized, so the sum of them is going to be equal to 1. If I only have one of them, it's going to be 1. So what this is saying is that um, I'm going to maintain this, this vector. I'm going to have for this, this function a of t. So these are going to be my coefficients for any value of t. And at, at the start, I'm going to have all of these be, um, um, so, so I'm going to maintain a set of coefficients, and for it's going to be um, a j is equal to zero um, for j not equal to j one, and a of j one is going to be equal to t. And in fact, I'm going to write this as t times um, times b j of 1. So this is a coefficient. So as I increase t, this is increasing at a rate that's linear in t. Okay, so okay, so, so now I'm describing as t is increasing, I can maintain these coefficients, and this corresponds to the value here in this ball. At some point, some magical point in between here, the value of t, I all of a sudden need to use, the, I want to use the second coordinate as well. Right, so, so there's a threshold of some kind, right? Right, so, so actually what I want to do is I want to um, Okay, um, what I want to do is find the point where if I were to start increasing a second coordinate, it would increase at the same rate as here. So this is actually as I'm increasing as I'm increasing this, the, the amount of gain I'm getting by moving this direction is not, is, is, um, this gain is diminishing. Um, as I move here, I'm, I'm, if I move past here, eventually I start getting further away, right? And as I move past, so th this magical point is if, if I drew this at a 45 degree angle until I hit this axis. So at, at, at this point right here, it's better to move along both of these coordinates. Right? Right? So as my, as my L1 ball keeps growing, I'm going to hit here if I threw it out to here. But at this point, I want to start moving along the next two coordinates. So what I want to do is to write this. Uh, so basically, I want to. Um, all right, I've I've written out. If you look in the notes, I've written out the like ten step algorithm of how to do this, um, and I'm probably not going to reproduce it because it's just going to be a lot of notation. But let me try and give an intuition here. So, so you want to to find a time t such that some um, j not equal to j1 has um, xj r of t equal to xj1 of r. Okay, what is r of t? r of t is this residual. So I've got this, this I'm also going to define these auxiliary kind of uh, variables which I'm going to maintain. 
So I've got this R of t, and this is going to be y minus um, let's see, y minus x a of t. Right. So, so this is the solution that I, I want to get to, and I have my data x, and I have these coordinates a. And as I'm allowed to have a larger t, I'm getting better and better coordinates, getting closer to y. And this RT is this residual is everything left over. Right? So this is what I want, and this is changing. Right? So this expression is changing. So, so initially, I could solve for this with this value y, and that was because um, the a was all zero, so this didn't do anything. Now as I progress, I need to look at this value R of t, and I say when for some other j other than the one I've already found, um, these are equal. Okay, when these are equal, then I want to move in this new direction towards, towards essentially towards the least square solution. And so the, these lines are always going to be these, um, these lines are always going to be linear. And, uh, and so at this point, I need to solve for new coefficients on E here. So at, at this point, I'm going to have, um, so at this point I'll have, um, so bj1 is going to be equal to 1 half, and bj2, which is the second one I find, is going to be equal to 1 half. And then I can change this a of t, so, so now um, the a of t is going to be a, aj equals 0 if j not equals to j1 or j2, otherwise aj1 is equal to, let's see, there was a special point, so this will be point t2, so it's going to be bj1 times t2, what the value was plus here, um, or I guess it's, it's, it had reached some constant value and now it's got this new linear term, actually this was, this was some value, I, and I'm not getting this notation right. Well, let's say it was it was t two. Yeah, so it was t two at this point, 